Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players, uncover their stories, and discover what makes them tick. If you love guitar, music, and the backstory of people's lives, stick around. You're in the right place. This episode of Everyone Loves Guitar is brought to you by Taylor Guitars and their new Grand Pacific Round Shoulder Dreadnought. Powered by Taylor's Breakthrough V-Class Bracing System, the Grand Pacific gives you a warm season sound with clear low-end power and notes that are stronger, longer sustaining, and more in tune with each other all the way up the fretboard. Make sure you check it out online at taylorguitars.com, then go out and play one today. That's the new Grand Pacific at taylorguitars.com. Did you know if your instrument or any of your gear is damaged, broken, or stolen outside your home, your homeowner's insurance policy will not cover any of it? That's right. Homeowner's insurance only pays if something happens inside your home. But Music Pro Insurance insures all your music gear, no matter where it is, anywhere in the world, even when you check it in as baggage on an airline. Here, let me give you some examples. Let's say you're in a car accident and your equipment is damaged, you're covered. Your kid pours apple juice into your amplifier, covered. Someone spills beer all over your pedal board at a gig somewhere across the world, boom, you're covered. Any kind of theft or accidental damage is covered, even water damage from hurricanes and breakage from earthquakes. But here's what makes Music Pro really different. They're not going to argue with you over the value of your instrument or make you run around looking for receipts when it comes time to paying your claim. They know exactly why your vintage instrument is worth 10 times more than a new one. Plus, all claims are typically paid and fully settled in 24 to 48 hours. So if your equipment is not insured properly, go to musicproinsurance.com, hit standard, then enter your information and get a free gear protection estimate. Don't be that player who ignores this, and then next month when something happens, you're wondering why you didn't take 10 minutes to do this properly. Make sure you go to musicproinsurance.com, enter your information, and get a free gear protection estimate. If something happens, you will be thanking me. Trust me on this, musicproinsurance.com. The Be Fulfilled Journal helps you be more honest with yourself and with others and be more open to handling things you've avoided dealing with for years. It's a 12-week online and journal program that helps you identify and eliminate things you do that are causing you stress and live in more gratitude and joy. It was actually developed by a long-term friend of mine who got sober in 2008, and he's put together a great deal just for my listeners. You get the 300-page hardcover journal and access to the 12-week video program online, plus free shipping, plus membership in a private Facebook support group with others going through the program, plus a five-day mini course showing you how to let go of stuff that's draining your energy, plus a 30-day 100% money-back guarantee. To start your journey and get all the bonuses, go to BeFulfilledJournal.com forward slash ELG. That's BeFulfilledJournal.com forward slash ELG. For information about advertising on Everyone Loves Guitar, including information on geographically targeted ads, go to EveryoneLovesGuitar.com forward slash advertise. That's EveryoneLovesGuitar.com forward slash advertise. Hey, everybody, this is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. And uh, my guest today, we're going to show some love to the rhythm section. Not only is he a cool guy, he's got like the coolest name ever. He could have done anything with this name. I mean, seriously, man, this is like the perfect entertainment. John Button. I mean, you could have been like anything from the most famous uh, musician or actor or like, you know, the guy who hosts the game show or who's like the best santa claus in per that's like the best name in the world i swear well well say i i i thank my uh my parents they did good man for that. they did great they worked it out uh john was actually from alaska and uh he was inspired by his four older musician siblings to start playing at a young age he started piano at age four and that laid the groundwork to move to string bass and bass guitar at seven by 14 he was playing in local jazz and blues bands symphonies and pit orchestras in high school he was honored with making the all national orchestra the all national jazz band and he won a scholarship to attend berkeley college of music summer program for high school students he then accepted a scholarship to 
study at University of North Texas in Denton, where like all the cool guys in the Midwest go. And uh, he played in their Grammy nominated top jazz band. I've interviewed a ton of great musicians from there, man. Um, he then moved to LA and uh, since then he's toured with many major artists, including The Who, Sheryl Crow, Robin Ford, and Shakira. He also played on recording sessions for albums from many artists, as well as major movies and television shows, including the Emmy-winning score of Batman and Beyond animated series. He's currently out on tour with Roger Daltrey. And before we get going, I just want to give a shout out to our man, Jason Orm, for hooking us up. Nice. I feel like my life just flashed to- Flashed before me. This is, you know what? You got, you're so, <laughs> like, I know you've probably played, you, like, I always, it's always like this. The guys, like, you just said I've played with some other sessions, basically, but you didn't say who. I'm sure they're, like, major artists. Guys who do, like, a lot of interesting stuff give me, like, a fucking paragraph. Guys who've done, like, you know, maybe not a lot of interesting stuff, I get a page and a half of, yeah. of you know, like, um, I remember when my mom saw me performing at <laughs> seven and i'm like yeah, that's real sweet but i don't know how many people are interested in that right. anyway dude thanks so much for coming on the show i appreciate my it. pleasure happy um, to be here yeah man this is good um i've interviewed a bunch of musicians from alaska strange do, do you, well i, I guess let me there's you, nothing to do there sorry to interrupt there's nothing to do there but you know it's dark all winter what are you gonna do is sit in your basement and practice i guess <laughs> do you know do you know uh david meyer guitar player plays I he's out with felder don't. No, I don't Don't know him. Yeah, another guy. You know Rick Holmstrom? He still lives in Alaska. Yes. I I know of him. Yeah. I think we've met. Yeah, he's a West Coast. He most of his uh, he tours all over with Mavis Staples, but I I know this most of his stuff is West Coast. And then um Chris Latham is original. You know him from Bisto Blanco? I know of him. Yes. He's an Alaska guy, man. Yep. Uh, uh, Never met people from Alaska. Now I met tons, man. I just I need to meet people in like Italy and shit like that. So I have <laughs> <laughs> well, stick with Alaskans. Alaskans are cool. <laughs> Alaskans are very cool. It's probably not a destination I'm going to hit. That's the only thing, man. I, oh, I, dude, just go. It's awesome. Really? Every, it's amazing. I, yeah. But what? It, yeah, I don't know. I have, is I, I want, I'm going to go to Hawaii. I got to get there again. So I don't know. Maybe yeah. I can do a Hawaii Alaska trip. There you go. But let me ask you this. So most all the people I've interviewed from Alaska have. You guys all have exactly like we just said, yeah, come to Alaska. It's great. There's like very deep ties to um, not just to the state, but to everything like it gives you nature wise. I noticed like all everybody really is grateful and like has enjoyed nature. I was curious how you feel about that and what you missed most when you left for Texas. Yeah, I mean, it is the – the nature component there is so strong. It's so kind of in your face there. It's Mm. so beautiful. And there's so much just pristine, untouched wilderness that just, it's, if you didn't, if you haven't spent time there, I would imagine it's probably hard to even imagine that Uh. there is just this expanse of untouched wilderness that just goes on forever. There's like hardly anybody out there. It's just miles and miles of miles and miles, you know, it's beautiful. Um, and, uh, yeah, that is what I did miss when I, you know, when I went to Texas, it was quite a shock. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, picture in Alaska where I was growing up, um, uh, my parents' house, you know, you, you look out across a beautiful valley with hills on the other side and then behind those are snow capped, big mountain peaks. And like, it just looks like a, you know, a painting of uh, Bob, uh, what's his name? Uh, Bob Ross. Painting uh, yeah. Bob Ross. Like, <laughs> no, seriously. Yeah, that's so cool. And then, so I go to Texas and when it becomes winter in Texas, there aren't really any evergreen trees. Yeah. So pretty much everything's Brown. There's no snow <laughs> to cover the Brown. It's just, fl- I mean, no, no offense to no, people, it's just... people that love Texas, but for yeah. me coming from Alaska, I'm sitting there and it's just flat brown there's just nothing and it was it was quite a shock and i definitely missed that real beauty of alaska you know uh, all the mountains and beautiful green trees and you know in the winter everything turns white like a little winter wonderland it's just it's pretty amazing very cool man yeah i noticed that with everybody i wrote down those three words pristine 
untouched wilderness. Now, flip the switch minute. I'm from the Bronx. Top three <laughs> words somebody from the Bronx never fucking said in their life <laughs> about their environment. <laughs> Pristine, untouched wilderness. That was great, man. That was that was awesome, John. Man, all all your brothers and sisters played music. Were your folks musicians or like part time musicians or? Yeah, my parents both played music. My uh, cool. neither professionally, but uh, my dad played woodwinds, and he used to, you know, make little instruments when he was a kid out of whatever he could find around. You know, that's cool. Um, and he was really into like big bands and swing music and stuff. Um, and then my mom uh, plays piano and sings, and she sang wow. in the uh, local choir, and um, yeah, very and cool. So they, and I think. You know, they just they thought it was enriching, you know, for us to learn how to play music. So all yeah. of us, you know, started piano real early. I think I probably started younger than any of the other kids. I think, you know, I mean, four. I think I think maybe I just just turned five when I started piano lessons. That's really young. Yeah, pretty, pretty young. God bless my teacher. I think her name was Teresa. Everybody who had a good teacher remembers that teacher. It's really funny. I mean, like anybody who had an influential teacher, no matter how far back, you know, I've interviewed guys that are in their seventies and they remember their first teacher that was really helpful to them. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, I got to look her up. My piano teacher, Sue, she's still around in Alaska. I got to reconnect. Yeah, man. Now's the time. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask, what, did any of your siblings become professional musicians? Um, my oldest brother, uh, who was a drummer, he went to Berkeley oh, in wow. Boston. Um, and, uh, he made a go of it for a couple years and, you know, life kind of got in the way. He had a kid young and was sort of like, I need to take care of my kid. I can't be scrounging around, you know, eating top ramen. So, uh, yeah, that's tough when you have a failed, kid, you know, I mean, he, he, Maybe things being different, maybe if he didn't have a kid, he'd, he'd sure. still be doing it. Um, my sister got a scholarship to Indiana v University. That's another great on, school. On violin. Wow. Is, Dude, and, this is wild. Yeah, so she was real serious. But she, I think she had the realization that um, to even have a shot at competing it, as a classical violinist, you have to practice like nine hours a day, like – like crazy and yeah. she was sort of like man do i is that for me she was a natural you know i think she just kind of could do it i don't think she, and i don't think she was interested in putting in that kind of time commitment i think is yeah. the impression i got so she uh moved on to other things but all my siblings you know they all were great you know did like whatever the all northwest orchestra or this and that um, that's really cool another brother man. played trumpet another brother played woodwinds um, and they were all all very good. It's five kids, man. God bless your parents. That's like right. Uh, that's oh my good. Yeah, that's pretty. I can't even imagine one one kid is. Well, you you have two, right? No, I have three. You have three. Oh my yeah, goodness. but they're all grown. But that's why I have no hair. I will sell you straight <laughs> up, man. And fucking kids, man. Um, because it's not like three times as much work. It's like. Like it's expo exponential, yeah, it's exponential. It's like to the <laughs> second, to the third, you know. And each one, it's just, and then by the third one, you just like, man, fuck it, whatever happens, because it's just like, you know, this is too much. You know, you just you, whatever, you know. It's you know, you see that cartoon or some meme or something. You know, your first child, like something drops on the floor, you're like, oh my god, you know. And right. the second child, you know, you pick it up and wash it. And the third child, you're like, you know, you don't even look, you know, just eat off the floor, whatever. It's it's because you're exhausted, man. You just can't, you know, it's tough to manage. I mean, I think partially who my parents were or are and uh, the time, you know, I think there was a certain laissez-faire just like whatever. You have you, to with five kids. Yeah, I guess. I mean, we, and I think we were pretty good kids. Like we had our heads screwed on straight That's for good. the most part. Yeah, that's so, great. you know, yeah. they kind of just let us do whatever. That's cool. I, don't, I, think, I think, it, think when you're in trouble. Yeah. But in Alaska, can, can you, I think you really have to work to get in trouble. I, I mean, right. <sighs> Depends on what kind of trouble you're talking about. I mean, 
<laughs> I can remember. <laughs> oh, Here uh, goes. The dirt comes out in the wash. <laughs> John Button. No, I, a buddy of mine, we, God, we must have been, I don't know, eight years old or something. He came over to my house for a play date or whatever. We were hanging out. And he was like, oh, let's walk back to my house. And I, I don't know why, some for some reason. So it was probably like two mi- two or three miles it's to a his lot house. when you're eight <laughs> in the winter it's winter there's like three feet of snow it's probably maybe it's zero if you're Holy lucky crap. we're like cool put on my snow suit let's go walk to you we walked to his house i don't know we were doing a bunch of dumb stuff and apparently uh his mom like lost it and like freaked out on my mom because like what are you doing let her kid but we you know I grew up in the like, you know, do whatever you want. So I was like, yeah, "Yeah, let's walk to your house. That's cool. Yeah, it's different. The reality is you're walking. I mean, I don't know if there was maybe one or two houses in those three miles. Maybe. I mean, we're just walking through the like tundra. (laughs) No, that's pretty scary. We could have, you know, we could have gotten in a lot of trouble theoretically. Yeah. Wow. (laughs) Well, now she wouldn't have been upset at your mom. She would have just sued her. (laughs) Yeah. Right? You could have had a Yeah, child, whatever, DCF or whatever. Yeah, seriously, these days, if you let your eight year old walk for three miles, you get arrested. Yeah, absolutely, man. It's a different world, bro. All right, I'm not down with that. Um, did you go to school at, at um, I know it's it was it's called, I think, North Texas State now, but it was University of North Texas when you went, probably. Um, I think it's the other way, or the other uh, way around. Maybe, yeah, anyway, yes, Do- I went to school there. Did you go to school or do you have any alumni there that like who's sort of well known now that you played with? Yeah. Um, I probably the the biggest name of note would be Keith Carlock. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Of Steely Dan fame at this point. Probably he also played with Sting and uh, James Taylor and all kinds of people. Um, So he, he and I got there at the same time. And actually, he and I met so in the little prologue there, you talked about, I got this McDonald's all American band thing. To Berkeley. He was in that as well. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, so we met in high school and I totally remember like just something, he was playing like marching band stuff, like snare and yeah. all that stuff. But I was like, this dude, like I could tell, I was like, this dude's got something special. Um, and so we met at that point and we kept in touch and we sort of were like, I remember, I think we were actually writing letters to each other or maybe calling on the phone. Um, Hold on a second. Internet. For <laughs> anybody under 25, a letter is something <laughs> that um, it's like a sheet of paper and you just put some thoughts down on it and then you put it in this thing called a mail. U.S. Post. <laughs> Sorry. Right. It, it was before the internet. <laughs> yeah. That's um, cool though. Okay. I I did that with a couple of people. It's that was like like a nostalgic memory of like yeah, I know. But so we were like, "Hey, you know, what do you what are you doing for college?" Like, uh, you know, we were both both of us were sort of like maybe Berkeley, maybe North Texas. Uh I was sort of thinking maybe something in California, I didn't know, but we ended up both going to North Texas. We we're like, "Hey, dude, let's room together." Oh, that's great. So we were roommates for we lived in the dorm together the first year and then we got apartment together the next like two years it was cool we played really nice um he dude he was i mean obviously he's still a monster but i mean he was he was exceptional really exceptional um anyway so that's that's really cool one of the the many did you guys like uh as you were both you know kind of growing your career did you have each other to talk to to like hey this is going on what do you think or what's going on with you i i uh Maybe a little bit. I don't think we we didn't talk too much career stuff, but we would definitely like, you know, I moved to L.A. He moved to New York. Um, we definitely ke- still keep in touch. And, you know, when our tours would cross, cross paths, which they do, I can remember hanging out with him in like Madrid, Spain. Like, Oh, that's cool, man. You know, out. Um, yeah, but I was, he's, you know, one of the many amazing musicians that came out of there during the time I was there. And he's probably the, the best known, but they're are many guys I went to school with that are doing all kinds of great things. Yeah. That's really good. The whole, you know, snarky puppy, all those guys, well, not all of them, but yeah. the lion's share of those guys came from there. Absolutely. There are also a lot, there are quite a few guys, um, in Nashville, a lot of drummers yeah. in Nashville playing with all kinds of big, 
big people and a couple of bass players I know too that are doing big big country country tours out of Nashville. I think yeah. uh, she's a little younger than you, Lindsay. What's her last name? Um, really good jazz guitar player, um, and she's in Nashville. Really nice. I've woman. heard of her. I, yeah, I had a baby. brain fart. Yeah, really, really, really nice. And she told me that um, the reason I thought of her is because when she first came was was. Keith ever in Nashville for a minute, maybe? He lives there now. Okay. Then so yeah. that's what happened. She was he invited her to come over and play and she was so like, Oh my God. And wow. he was she yeah, and she said on the interview, I remember her saying how what it, you know, like she was really intimidated, but you know, they had that North Texas State thing and he was just incredibly ingratiating to her and uh, you know, made her feel awesome. really welcome. And she's a monster player, so I mean right. um Oh that's nice yeah, to hear. Yeah, yeah. So what was your first – you get out of college. What was your first major gig, John? Oh, my goodness. Uh, well, de- that's debatable depending on your definition <laughs> of major Your definition gig. doesn't um, matter mine. No, your definition um, totally doesn't matter. I do, I do remember kind of one sort of little stepping stone. I was – so when I got out of school, I stayed in Dallas for maybe about a year. Um, and right before I moved to LA, I started playing with a smooth jazz artist named Joe McBride. Um, and that was my first quote unquote tour. Um, oh my God, which is hilarious. So, <laughs> uh, I get the gig. It's a, the first tour is like a short tour in the U S and Joe is a piano player and singer. He's a blind guy or, wow. uh, what's the politically correct way to say that? Is that Bl- right? Blind? I don't know. Blind? <laughs> uh, visually impaired? You can't, it doesn't uh, matter. Whatever okay. you say, somebody's going to get offended. Very good point. So it, oh, it actually, just, just so doesn't matter. There's no bad intent, so that's it. All right. The dude you know? can't see. Right. So um, uh, he's amazing, too. Amazing musician. Um, blah, blah, blah. So uh, I, get the tour, I get called to do the tour. I'm like, I don't know, 22, just out of college. Um, it's pretty cool. Like, wow, a real gig. Um, I talk to the manager, Hey, how much is the money? It's like $3 a week or something. Um, and, <laughs> and you're like, yes. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. And, uh, how are we, you know, how are we getting around bus dude, a bus tour? Awesome. Great. <laughs> Sounds great. So then whatever, a couple weeks go by time for the tour. Here's your tickets, tickets, tickets for what the bus. <laughs> you're going to like go down to the Greyhound. <laughs> Yes. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my because, God. So in, in the manager's defense, he was like, I don't want to lay it on the musicians to draw. Like if we do a van tour, they all have to drive. Joe can't drive. Sure. Sure. You know, cause he's Cause he can't not see. seeing. Yeah. He can't see so good. Yeah. Um, so the manager wow. was sort of like, well, this is the best option is to put you on a Greyhound bus. Yeah. So dude, yeah, but there's no – part of your whole thing is the camaraderie of, you know, the brotherhood of what you do. There's nothing – there's nothing uh, relationship-oriented sitting on a Greyhound bus with a bunch of people, you know, running away from home or whatever. Yeah, nothing until you get to Chicago and <laughs> you relive Spinal Tap. <laughs> and, yeah – <laughs> we needed three suites on the fifth floor. Now we have one suite on the yeah. No, oh one room. My God. Sorry, guys. Something got screwed up. Everybody's in the same room, so now you're sharing a bed with the guitar player. Nice. And I told him, my good friend Tim Copes, another North Texas guy that lives out here in L.A. One of the two people I knew when I moved to L.A. We'll get to that later, but maybe. Um, but I was like, Tim, you you have a steady girlfriend. <laughs> I'm not her. Right, I'm 22, so I'm like, and then of course, middle of the night, he like rolls over, and he was like, "Oh, hey, John." <laughs> <laughs> nice. Oh, but you know, you look back with fond memories. That's crazy, man. Juice. That's the they, first time I've heard that a Greyhound bus. I've interviewed about 450 people. That's the first one, a Greyhound bus. Wow. Right? Welcome to the music business. I know. So let's talk about that. Um, what made you move out to LA and what was that like? Like what'd you do when you first got out there? Uh, so 
we'll back up a little bit, which is, so I stayed in Dallas for about a year after I got out of school because I was playing in like a cover band, wedding band kind of situation um, that paid pretty well. Yeah. As those gigs do from what I hear. Yeah. yeah. And I had an apartment in Denton, Texas, where University mm-hmm. of North Texas, which is like out in the middle of nowhere, pretty much, or at least it was when I went there. Um, so I had, I shared an apartment with another guy, um, that was 180 bucks a month. So my oh rent my was $90 God. a month. You're kidding me. No. So <sighs> I took all the money. I lived like wow. a pauper. Yeah. And shoved all that money that I, you know, all that money, whatever I made. Well, no, but it's saving a lot of money when you're paying yeah, 90 so bucks I, a month rent. I saved and saved and saved. Um, so when I moved to LA, I, you know, had a bit of, yeah, you had a little bit of my, sleeping. Yeah, you could so sleep I, at night. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I drove out there with two other wow, friends good for you. from North Texas that were moving to LA. One of which, uh, was a film composer. Um, and another guy, uh, that ended up doing like pro audio, uh, like mixing TV shows and stuff like that. Um, so the three or uh, there was one other guy too, another drummer. So the four of us all kind of caravaned out to LA, um, shared an apartment. I think there was three of us in a one or two bedroom, you know, Mm. sleeping on the floor, blah, blah. Um, I knew two people, my buddy, Tim Copsa that was on the Joe McBride tour. Um, and, uh, and another friend and, you know, through those guys, I, Tim was really helpful. He introduced me. He was, I think he was at that time getting his master's degree at USC and he now teaches at USC. And so he sort of hooked me into that USC world. They're a pretty good music program there. Yeah. Um, so I met some guys from there and, you know, sort of just said yes to everyone. Yeah. And, <laughs> and things started growing. Yeah, you know, it took a minute, but thankfully I had that money saved up. I went and uh, I thought, oh, I better get a job. So I went and trained doing telemarketing. Wow. You got a good personality and you're, you know, you're quick. So that was probably a good fit for you. Well, thank you. But no, it was not. A good fit. <laughs> they were like, I did sort of the yeah. training, you know, for a few hours. And they're like, okay, here's your phone. Call <laughs> here's your some script. person. And I was just like, uh, I can't do this. I gotta go. Bye. Oh, you and just left. It. That's so oh, funny, man. Like, what were they having God. you sell? God, I don't honestly. I think they were surveys, maybe. Oh, you know, between you yeah. Know, yeah, I think it was sort of like, what's your feeling about this product? And yeah, on a scale of one to ten or something. I don't even remember. Wow, um, so you just yeah, I wasn't your thing. I was like, I'm out of here. That's surprising. I got, man, mon- I got money in the bank. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need this that badly. Wow, that's wild, man. I give you credit for being disciplined enough to save as a young kid. That's not always common. Right? Yeah. I, you know, I mean, I think it was just my vision of like, hey, I want to move to L.A. and do this thing, and like, I just had that goal in my sights. You know, I think that's what helped. What made you pick L.A. as opposed to? I guess either New York or Nashville, maybe you're pretty far from home, no matter what. That's the thing. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't remember exactly what really made me decide that. I always sort of, I mean, growing up in Alaska, there's definitely a West coast vibe. So I felt comfortable with the West coast. Hmm. Um, Over New York for sure. Yeah. Uh, and I, I had been to LA when I was in high school and I really liked it. Okay. There was just a vibe here that, that appealed to me. I really wanted to do studio work and stuff like that and tour as a, you know, kind of pop and rock musician, I think. And LA is the place to do that. I think I'd kind of gotten burned out on jazz a little bit at North Texas. It's so jazz, jazz, jazz. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, I kind of, was starting to kind of move away from wanting to be a jazz guy. And I felt like New York, I think was more jazzy. Yes. Um, so I think that was some of the parts of my decision, but I, I don't remember exactly what really made me decide, but well, man, I got to give you credit because you actually lived your vision and your dream. And, you know, as a guy on the outside, yep. I have so much respect for all the guys and gals I interview that have done that. Because that's, it takes a lot of courage and, and it's, you know, 
um, it's just really cool. I think not many people do that. Yeah, I feel very fortunate. Thank you for saying that. And all, yeah. I mean, I there was an article in my hometown newspaper. I must have been about twelve or something, and they interviewed me about you know whatever music and stuff. And I said in that like, oh, I want to you know move to L.A. and be a studio musician. Oh, so you had this vision for a, quite a while. Oh, yeah, that's really, awesome, yeah. man. Yeah. That's really cool. Do you do? Yeah. Uh, is that like your makeup naturally? Do you naturally just sort of like, uh, um, I, I don't want to sound all all L.A. like manifest things, you know? Right. But, but like you know, there are, no, yeah, right. There are people like I don't know if you do you know who Mike Keneally? Yeah. yeah so yeah. I interviewed Mike, and he had this whole thing. He's like different, next level, like intellectually, and he had this like crystal vision. Of of him wanting to play for Frank Zappa, and it's almost like he made it happen. I mean, right. literally. Interesting. Yeah. And so I mean, um, this is the same thing that you're saying. Yeah i I feel like for me that kind of thing, for whatever reason, just came very naturally and sort of almost subconsciously. It wasn't like a real. Uh, sort of figured out conscious, like I'm going to do this and that will lead to this. I think I just, something naturally, I, it, it just, I just sort of, like I say, subconsciously do that naturally or something. That's great. Yeah. I'm really happy. Yeah, for that, man. That's really Thank cool. God. Really cool. <laughs> well, the nice thing is too, now, you know, you could bring that kind of mindset to your son with, that's the cool thing about it now. You know, right. that, so that he could that. So then, you know, thinking things, thinking about things and sort of like, again, not to sound, you know, silly, but manifesting them or, you know, organically making them happen, you yeah. know, is the norm for him, which is what I think. Is yeah, really maybe. Cool. Yeah, wow. I think that's really cool. Yeah, you never know. Trust me. Trust me. <laughs> uh, man, so let me talk about um, I'm going to throw some names of or some artists out there that you have worked with. And if you could talk about how you get the gig. And a cool or interesting story about working with them, man. Let's start with the Who because that's like one of the greatest gigs in the world, man. I mean, honestly, it really is. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Seriously, it's crazy. It's still. I mean, I started with them in 2017, so that was a couple of years ago, and it's still just like so. It doesn't seem real. It's so weird to me. People are like, "Oh, hey, man, nice to meet you. Who do you play with?" I'm just like. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I mean, you, know, you you feel like you'd be like, oh my god, I play with the hoot. But for me, I'm just like, it feels so awkward because like people just don't believe you, and then then they're just like all super excited and treat you different, and it's just like, oh, this is so awkward and weird. I mean, I, don't get me wrong, it's a fantastic problem to have. But I totally just for get me, it. I'm a humble guy, and it just always feels awkward. And like, I honestly kind of keep it on the DL, like yeah. at my school where my kid goes to yeah, school yeah. and stuff. I try to like not tell people cause then they just get weird. And- oh yeah. Then they'll be like, shh, shh, shh. and then they're like, uh, Oh, hi John. Hey. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, uh, it's like, I hate that. I just like, <laughs> but anyway, do you, so- do you, a quick story on that. Do you know yeah. guy Pratt bass player? Yeah. Yeah. Guy. And he's actually friends with Pete. Sure. Yeah. Me. So, huh? so for people listening, um, I interviewed Guy and his interview, I don't know when it's coming out, but he has been playing with uh, Pink Floyd and Gilmore since Roger Waters left. Tony Levin came in for, I think, the first album, then he's been the bass player. Anyway, uh, he's been around a long time and he said a comment to me and I asked him a question, something about how have you changed? Because I think I've changed because most of my life I felt like I'm going to get found out soon. Like kind of like what you were saying in a way, because like you know that you know they're gonna find me out that I shouldn't be on all these gigs and and like uh, I'm gonna sure. get outed. I think every artist has yeah. that feeling, right? I think, or a lot yeah. of us do. You know, ninety per seventy five percent for sure. And he goes, and I I'm at the point now where I'm like I'm okay. I'm not worried about being outed <laughs> anymore. And he's <laughs> my, he's maybe a couple of years older than me. Yeah. So. um uh, but that's reminded me of what you said because he, I guess he's up there with Gilmore. You're up there with 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 uh, Townsend and 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 Roger. It's it's the same thing. It's like what the hell? How 
How? <laughs> yeah, I see pictures of myself with them. I'm just like, really? Really? <laughs> I, I guess there's a photo of it. So it must be real. Um, yeah. Uh, so uh, I think you asked how yeah, you get the I gig? got the gig. Um, so I got the gig with Roger first, mm. almost ten years ago. Um, cause Roger does when the who's not touring, Roger wants to, you know, he wants to keep singing and keep out there, be out there doing it. Um, so he, Pete wasn't touring enough for Roger. So Roger was like, Oh, let me do a solo band and get out there and do it. Um, so a dear friend of mine, uh, amazing guitar player, uh, Pete, Pete Thorne. Yeah. Um, he recommended me to audition. His friend, Frank Symes, was helping put the band together for Roger. Yeah, I got LA. Frank coming so, to my show soon. Oh, cool. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, Pete recommended me to Frank. Frank was like, hey, do you know any bass players? We're putting together this Roger Daltrey tour. And Pete was like, hey, my buddy John would be great. Um, so I auditioned with, you know, 150,000 other L.A. musicians and – I wound up getting that gig with Roger. So I played with awesome. Roger, you know, for years. Um, and uh, in 2017, Pino Palladino, who had been playing with The Who since sure. John Entwistle passed away, um, he, The Who didn't have a ton of work in 2017, 2018. And so Pino was like, I've got this nonstop year and a half world tour with John Mayer paying me apparently a handsome sum of money. So I'm going to go do that. And so the, who were like, uh, who's going to play bass. And Roger was like, Hey Pete, get my guy, John. He's, he's a nice guy and it's an okay bass player. And you know. <laughs> um, so then you are they, humble, man. <laughs> they had, uh, like, a. no, you're really humble because I'll tell you what, you're playing with one of the brightest ever human beings to write, and and create music in in Pete Townsend, and he could oh, have anybody up there, man. So you yeah, know, well, he's oh, yeah. a fucking I genius, agree, yeah. that guy, man. I totally agree. Um, but the the initial thing with the Who was they had like a two week tour in England, and then subsequent stuff after that. And so it was put to me like, hey, we'll do these two weeks, see how it goes, you know, see how Pete likes you, see how you fit in with the band. Yeah, yeah, um, and th you know. And then, of course, like towards the end of the two week tour, the road crew is like, hey, so how do you want to ship your gear to the next? I'm like, nobody's, told, like, you know, it's just it's don't do along. this, guys. Yeah, Come exactly. on. So I had to like go to them and be like, so uh, am I, I off double secret yeah. probation or what? Yeah, yeah exactly. And everything worked so I out. Guess I wasn't. Yeah, That's wasn't. great, man. Congratulations. I'm real Far. happy for you, man. That's really <laughs> Thank cool. Thank you. I mean, it's, yeah, it's dream come true. What a, I mean, there what gig could be better than, I mean, it's just like, I got to ask you thing one, on the planet. one fanboy question. The first time you're on stage and you hear like any classic who song and you know, you got Pete on one side and Roger on the other side, or I don't know how you're standing like, like, you know, like Baba O'Reilly or anything from who's next. What the, anything that you listen to in your kid, what was going through your mind? Don't screw up. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it together. Don't, don't screw this up. That, that had to be incredibly like weird, right? It is. Yeah. I mean, with the who I kind of eased into it because I, I, I had 10 years of listening to Roger's voice. Yeah. 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 You know? okay. So I kind of eased into it. Yeah. But okay. I mean, honestly, just Pete's energy. He is an intense dude. Yeah. And just looking across the stage and see, I mean, when he plays, he is in it 110%. He's almost like possessed. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. Um, and just to sort of be part of that spirit is incredible. Um, and can, you know, can be a little intimidating, but yeah. Man, I'm so uh, happy for you, man. That's great. Thank you. That's really cool. I'm very happy for you, man. And, and you know, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. 
I hope you come to Tampa <laughs> for, for selfish reasons. I'd love to come see you guys play. I got to see the Who sometime before. Yeah, I- come on, I'll let you know. I, we're, I think we we are really maybe. Yeah, I forget. Well, I'll. I'll we'll oh, dude, at, that's awesome. Look at the schedule. I think we're down there at some point. Cheryl Crow. Okay, that's that's actually the uh, how I got that gig. That is kind of interesting. I think. Um, so I had done about a year and a half, two years, I think two years with Sh- Shakira. Mm. So that tour wrapped up. So then it's like, well, what do I do now? Um, and you must have, uh, let me cut you off, but you must have really good, um, really good hanging skills and really good stage presence because these are all like top 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 you know these these guys didn't just fall off a log these artists you're working with man these guys are like top performers man so that's good for you man that's really Thank cool you. well you mentioned hang skills i mean that's that's criteria one yeah i mean i don't know if i have i'm, I'm just i'm a nice guy i'm easy to get along with yeah you know yeah i don't cause trouble you know and that that's huge because I mean, there are so many great players that are all just standing in line. If you're a jerk out on the road, I mean, you're in close quarters all the time, you know, for two years straight. If, if you're a stinker, yeah, there's, you know, 20 nice guys that could probably play circles around you that you're right behind you. Yeah. yeah. But but you've also got to have great stage presence too, because these are, these are really top acts and i'm not like saying it to blow smoke up your ass i'm just saying it as a statement of fact you know you this is not amateur hour that you're talking about here man yeah yeah i mean i i i've definitely spent my ten thousand hours on stage yeah well i'm saying you probably <laughs> you know? i know you've worked at it it's, it's not like you know oh, i'm just you know there I, I know it's something that you have to everything is something i mean with rare exception for rare people everything is pretty much something you have to work on you know it's not just yeah. like you know, right. I have great stage presence. Okay. You know, right. You yeah. Know. I mean, I think part of having good stage presence is just being comfortable and having just put in the hours, just been, mm. you know, I've, I, <laughs> I've spent a lot of time on stage, but, but the, I think when, like, to me, what makes a good con- a concert's a transference of energy, right? Yes. So right. it's a transference of energy as a as a guy in the audience i want that transference when when i get a transference of energy from the performers that gets me juiced and i'm i'm assuming you guys on stage when you're feeling it from the audience that gets you juiced so you have to be able to put that out in a very definite way yeah you know yeah, I think there, so. and yeah, there's an yeah, art to sure. that you just can't lay there like a locks and then like you know it just doesn't happen you know right. I mean, we've all yeah. seen it and like move, please, you know, do something, smile, yeah. you know, I mean, like yeah, you yeah. Know, pretend you're happy, you know, I right. saw, it's really funny. I saw a gig uh, and I don't want to say who it was, but really well-known guitar player with a well-known band and man, it, it was, you know, band from the like eighties, real loads of hits. And the guy was just like going through the motions. It was just awful. It was so sure. disappointing. He's one of my like favorite players. And I was like, please, I don't want to be seeing this. You know, I'm hoping that he just had a bad night or whatever, but that could um, be. I mean, if you're not, ha- if you're not enjoying yourself on stage, then uh, all that stuff you talked about is just, he was miserable, man. He was absolutely yeah. miserable. You could see it. So, so I think part of it for me is I just, I love what I do. Yeah. You know, yeah. so that and uh, so it's not a conscious thing of like, oh, I have to have my stage presence. I think I'm just happy to be course, up there. Yeah. I'm comfortable. You know, I, for me, that's what. Yeah. What works. Yeah. Sorry, but, man. Uh, Cheryl Crow. That's right. Two years Cheryl with Crow. Shakira. So, yeah. So two years What's with Shakira. What's next? What do I do now? Um, and I turn on the TV and I see my. My buddy Mike Elizondo playing bass with Cheryl Crow on TV. And previous to that, Cheryl had always played bass herself. She's a very good bass player. Oh, I didn't so know on that. a lot of her tours, yeah. So she would play okay. bass. That's interesting. Um, and she had a guitar player that doubled on bass. So between the two of them, they'd cover the bass duties. So then I see on TV, I see my friend Mike Elizondo, amazing bass player, playing bass with her. But Mike at that time was also 
becoming or had become at that time a big producer songwriter like bass had sort of be i mean he's a brilliant bass player but he had sort of moved on to like big time i mean he like co-wrote 50 cents big like oh wow in the club song holy shit um he had co-produced stuff with dr dre like i'm talking you know like yeah that's big huge huge and at that time i mean you know that was when was that like early 2000s like i mean he must have made a zillion dollars so there he is playing bass with Sheryl crow i'm like hmm he's not gonna go on tour with Sheryl crow when he's you know like producing 50 cent right (laughs) Right. um so i call mike and i'm like hey man i just got off this shakira tour um so i'm kind of looking for a gig if you hear of anything you know any gigs pop up that you think i might be good for that they might need a bass player you know give me a shot cool we, you know, mm. he calls me back like, "Hey, funny you should call. I'm doing this Shakira gig, or this uh, Cheryl Crow gig, and I'm I'm probably not going to do the tour now. So I'll put your name in the hat." Wow. Yeah. See, but man, you know what? I re- people don't realize a lot of people would be afraid to make that call. As was I. But you did I it. Mean, there was part. Of, of course, you're afraid, of, yeah. but you did yeah. it. Yeah, you, you did it, man. And you yeah. changed your destiny because of that. You know, so Absolutely. you know, awesome to you. Yeah. And so then the audition process was really crazy because, uh, Cheryl lives in Nashville. Her drummer and her keyboard player were living in London. Oh, wow. Her guitar players lived in Atlanta. So you can't just like, Hey, let's get the boys together and have an audi- a bass audition. Yeah. So what they had to do was have the bass audition on day one and then rehearsals start day two and then day five or six, like there's a show in New York and then day eight, there's a show in London. So she auditioned three bass players. The other two guys are very good friends of mine, uh, Brett Simons and why not Jansfield, amazing bass players. Um, and so all three of us had to have our bags packed. Oh, wow. Have a visa for the show in London like That's stressful, man. Yeah. And awkward. I mean, I mean, the, those Brett. Is, yeah. And then you're sitting there with like, your luggage. And if you don't get to go, it's you like, got to take you, your you, bags you, and go home. Yeah, it's like the little kid getting kicked out of, uh, you know, the right. club or something, man. That's awful. I know. And, yeah. and like I say, I mean, why not? I didn't know him well at the time. He's become a good friend. Brett's one of my dearest friends. You know, we're sitting on the plane across from each other. Like, May the best man win. Yeah, 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 sure. Um, And, uh, I mean, playing with Cheryl was, like, totally a dream for me. Like, I am a big fan of her music. Um, I opened for her with, I was playing with Michelle Branch, I think. Oh, wow. And we did a tour opening for Cheryl. I would watch them every night and, like, whoa, man, that's that's a cool gig. Like, um, and I found, I got word of the audition probably about a month in advance. Um, so I worked on that stuff. Like I've never, I was like, I am getting this gig. Right. This is going to change my life. This gig, nothing is standing in my way. Dude, and there I, you go. You need to be a motivational speaker now, man. That's your, if this John button, if this doesn't work, you come see me, we'll do plan B. I'm a marketing guy, man. I've worked in 110 <laughs> industries. Seriously. That's my, I've run a marketing company for 20 years. We'll get you, oh, wow. we'll get you up in freaking running you'll be the new guru oh my god um but yeah so for a month i literally probably worked on cheryl crow music for like eight hours a day that's great i would i love hearing record myself playing along with it listen back nah not quite good enough need to do this need to do that so when i came into the audition i like you were I, so prepared, over prepared, probably. Way over prepared. Yeah, that's great. That's I was great. Like, it was I like I've been man. on tour with them for two years. Man, you can't beat work ethic. That I don't think so anyway. That's the best trait someone could have. Well, like, being prepared. Yeah, that's great, is, man. Yeah, that's so yeah. cool. Um, who was her? Was who was her guitar player then? Uh Tim Smith was one guitar player, uh, and. Uh, uh, oh my god really am i actually pete pete stroud oh right 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 right. he's still with her 
Peter Strauss? Yeah. Yeah, 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 man, he's amazing. Yeah, he's a amazing he's a guitar, guitar player. player and a sweetheart of a guy. Jason played with her for a minute, didn't he? Did he? I don't. I don't know I, that. I, Could I, be. I think he played. Play. He's played with a lot of female artists, so I get confused. Um, he very well could. Yeah, could have. Have. yeah, not while I was doing it, but yeah, that's possible. And, then, and so how long were you with Cheryl for? That whole tour? Yeah, I think it was about two years. That's, that's a lot, man. Yeah. Um, and then uh, she actually, at the end of those two years, she let the whole, she had had guys with her, some of those guys were with her for like, I think Tim Smith who'd been with her for 18 years or something like that. She let everybody go and decided, I want to do something totally different. She did like kind of a Atlantic soul R&B mm. kind of thing. She just sort of reinvented herself for a minute. Yeah. Um, hey, welcome to the music business. You're all fired. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, she was. You know, yeah, I know. I, I know. I, you guys did great. You're fired. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you for your hard work. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I know yeah. that's just the way the business works, man. And then you know, and then I was in that spot again where you're like, "Wow, Cheryl Crow. What you know? What? How? How do you top that? What do you do next? And then what is is that when Rogers? Yeah. yeah. Dude, so you just like been. Next, yeah, yeah, that was awesome. That's so cool, man. I'm, that's great. How about Robin Ford? Um, I only did a few things with Robin. Um, I was recommended to, hit, to him by an amazing drummer named Toss Panos. Yeah, I know who, who is. is one of the, I think, kind of most underrated, yeah. most misunderstood drummers in LA. Yeah, he's a great drummer. Um, he's unbelievable um but he had been playing with robin for a long time and um for whatever reason robin needed a bass player to fill in for a few gigs so i did that it was actually it was sort of while i was doing the cheryl gig there was like a break with cheryl and i kind of slipped in and did a few robin gigs cool. which was kind of amazing i mean to be playing with robin ford and cheryl crow at the to same time. subbing with robin that's not a bad deal man. i was like well, this is <laughs> i remember being like in the hotel room on the Cheryl tour, like working, learning Robin Ford mm. tunes. I was just like, wow, this is amazing. Good for you, man. Like, yeah. Do you know Brian Allen, bass player? No, I don't. Okay. He, he played I with Robin know. for a while. He's, he, oh, okay. he's a, he's a West, well, originally West coast guy. Anyway. Um, what made you just one quickly, you started on piano. What made you switch over to bass? Um, so all my siblings started on piano and moved to other instruments. Okay. So I was like, that's what you do. Yeah. Yeah. That makes total sense. So, yeah. I mean, I don't know. And the reason I switched to bass was because my oldest brother, the drummer, um, he was trying to like get bands together in Fairbanks, Alaska, and there weren't many dudes around and they could never find a bass player. He, you know, there was like eight drummers and 13 <laughs> guitar players <laughs> You know, and he would jam with people, just him playing drums and the guitar player. And they're like, there's no bass player. So he bought a bass and learned how to play bass so he could be the bass player. Um, and he was 10 years older than me. So I was six and he was 16. Oh, that's really cool to grow up with kids that much older than you, man. Yeah. yeah and cool. he, I mean, he was so generous to like, you know, he bought this expensive bass and sure, six year old brother. Yeah. Yeah. That is go really at it. cool. Yeah. Right. Um, so, and I still have that bass. It's a beautiful, that is really nice. That's really yeah. Nice. Um, so he, you know, he showed me some things and would let me play around with it. Um, and my mom being the brilliant person that she is, she was like, Oh, you should join the school orchestra, you know, and learn to play string bass. Um, so sure enough, third grade. Wow. I hop into the, and thankfully growing up in Alaska, tons of oil money. All right. Right. So, uh, we were want of nothing in our school. In school. That's great. So orchestra in third grade um, with a great teacher. Um, so, yeah, I started playing in the orchestra, learning to read music, play, you know, doing the whole thing. That's great, man. Very so cool. I would – I was taking string bass lessons, learning classical stuff, and then at home, you know, picking out songs off of records and on the electric bass. And, yeah. Very cool. Does your, do your brothers and sisters still live in Alaska or do they leave? Uh, one is still up there and then the rest are scattered all over the globe. Wow. <laughs> it sounds like you've, you've been 
really smart about things in general and really diligent. Is there any advice like that you would have given to your younger self that would have made things easier for you, either business or personally? Um, I, you know, I would say maybe I would have worked on singing earlier. Mm. Um, cause as a touring sideman, being a great singer is a, especially as a bass player, I think is a real asset Yeah, and I'm, I'm okay. You know, I sing, I've sang backing vocals on a lot of tours that I've done. Come and on, I'm, show me. I'm okay. Let's do something. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> me, 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 me. Let me just warm up. Um, but like, I'm a, I'm a, just kind of okay yeah. singer. And I, you know, I work with guys that are just awesome singers, and I'm often jealous of their abilities as a singer. So I kind of wish I had like maybe taken lessons and stuff as a kid. Mm, sure, singer. That'd be one regret yeah that's like almost like a career move there's no way you would have ever known that like make sure you work on your background vocals yeah well yeah. especially you know i mean when i was in high school i wanted to be like a jazz upright player you know oh, wow. like, so uh, you know don't I, need to ever open your mouth ever exactly. ever I gotta, ever i gotta work on my uh my my minor two fives yeah and yeah fear, you know holy so. um how does Roger keep his voice like that, man? Does he like, is that just, does he do a lot of exercises or is he just like blessed with these? I think there, he doesn't, I don't, I don't see, he does not seem to do like vocal exercises and warm up as wow. typical singers that I know do. Um, I think uh, he does do some, some stuff. Um, part of it is just he he wants to keep out there and keep singing. That's part of the reason that he does his solo tours is he's afraid if he doesn't go out and he feels like there's no way he can replicate being on tour by practicing on his own or sitting at home singing. Wow, he's the like, energy oh. is not yeah. – you're he's not like, going to push the way you're going to put – you know, you're going to stand in front of a mirror and scream. Right. So you do that for a, a measure yeah, or exactly. chorus you know, or something like that, but not and, for – one of his solo tours was called use it or lose it, hmm. which was basically yeah. you know, saying like he has to stay out there doing it to keep his, his instrument in shape. Um, but also he has had several surgeries. Oh, wow. He has this guy, there's a guy in Boston. Um, that's a miracle worker with vocal cord surgery. Um, and he also, he's, he's worked on a lot of famous singers that have had issues. Um, but he's also helped like, uh, cancer patients that have lost their voice and helped wow, them. Wow. That's great. Super that's amazing. That's really yeah. cool. Really um, cool, man. and I don't know exactly what he does, but he's helped Roger a lot. And in fact, when I first started with Roger, we started rehearsals and Roger was having a lot of trouble with his voice. And I was like, uh, how is this going to go? Like it was, it was rough at the beginning. And then he got uh, one of his surgeries and it's like, you could hear like when he came back and talk, you could hear it in his voice when he talked, his voice was like tighter and like, um, not as growly. Hmm. Oh. And so I think that's a definite big part of it is this surgeon. That's great, man. And one of the greatest, if, not the greatest voice ever in rock yeah, and roll, he man. Yeah, still he sounds amazing. I mean, he sounds better now than he did ten years ago when I started with him. He sounds incredible now. That's cool, He's man. Killing it, yeah. Um, let's talk about music for a little bit. Have you seen any really good concerts? Like, what are the top two or three concerts you've seen? Oh my goodness! Um, so we just did uh one of these concert uh concert like cruises. Yeah, yeah. Adultery. It was called the legends of rock cruise and there was a ton of bands on it and i saw i mean you know this is on the top off the top of my head because i just saw them like sure what a week or two ago but um buddy guy right was on the tour um and he 
has you can tell that he's been doing it for so long and like being in front of an audience he has the audience yeah like play yeah, in the palm of his hand he like his banter between songs all his just interaction with the audience i mean on top of he still sounds great yeah he shreds playing. oh yeah, my he is he's got a lot of fire yeah really does playing. and he's like sorry he's old as dirt no he's got to be like close to 80 very close to age, if not, yeah, because he, because I remember when, when he came out with that song, "I'm 74 Years Young." That's got to be close to. He might be over 80. I think he is. Yeah, that's, I mean, and he he seems like he's in good shape. Yeah. I mean, you can definitely tell he's, you know, no spring chicken. Uh, but anyway, he was yeah. amazing seeing him, um, just as a stage presence, like we were talking about before. Yeah, like he man, he was amazing. Um, and then also uh, Eric Gales, yeah, was on that tour, dude. Yeah, he's a I was player. aware. I've been aware of him for a while, um, but I'd never seen him live. Wow. Yeah. That dude, to me, his combination of like he's lived the blues. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like he's been to prison and like I, I don't know what all he's had a life. Yeah. So I think he's got sober and playing. stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. That comes out in his playing. But on top of that, that combination of that sort of history and heart and soul that he has combined with this technical ability it seems pretty rare. That combination to me. Of yeah. Those. He's a really good player. I need to yeah. get with him and get him on the show. Yeah. So. Yeah. He would probably have a lot of interesting stuff. I mean, his life, I don't know his story. I just know it's, it's, uh, it's checkered. Yeah. Yeah. He's played the blues. He's lived the blues, man. I think it was a good yeah, thing man. that you said it, man. Um, who else were some great concerts? Uh, God, it's hard to. Sorry, think off the top of my head. Uh, burr, burr. But those those are oh, a couple cool. of recent ones. Which buddy was there? Because you know I've seen Buddy four or five times, and it's always a different. Like sometimes it's the Buddy guy who's like kind of buzzed, you know, and he's he's kind of he's, he's hammered actually, or what a and motherfucker, right. motherfucker, and he's like <laughs> he's got to be out of his mind. Like I don't know what he was drinking. And then there's you know the other Buddy guy, you know. And he's always a fiery, great player. The playing is never different. It's just which, it's like which personality shows up on any given. Yeah, night. I think it was somewhere in between. He definitely was, you know. Yeah, he's he had, like he yeah. had had a couple drinks, but not too many. Yeah, right. It seemed, yeah, yeah, it was about it was good. Um, yeah. Any interesting or cool stories behind how you got any of your bases? Sure. Yeah. Well. Uh, so my my dear oldest brother that got me my first base. Um, he was at Berkeley in Boston. Uh, and I was up there in Alaska and, uh, kind of wanting to move from a Rickenbacker, you know, I was getting into Daryl Jones and Marcus Miller. And mm -hmm. so I needed a jazz, a Fender jazz bass. Mm -hmm. Um, so I rang him up and said, you know, it's hard to, you know, you can't find a, a vintage jazz bass in Fairbanks, Alaska. There's really not don't. a ton of music stores there, is there? No, I mean there are a couple, but you, you know it's you know it's it's limited. Do they even do do, do they have like a postal service there even? Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. It, it, <laughs> well, yeah, man. I mean it was it's, when I was young. It's it probably was probably remote, it, right? It was pretty backwards. Yeah, like you yeah. know, we only had a couple TV channels, and like all our movies were second run movies. Really? And, wow. I mean, when you ordered something, it took like a month. It was like shipping it to England. Literally, <laughs> literally took a month. You know, it wasn't like wild. Amazon next day delivery, you know. So it was definitely, oh, I mean, wow. I, remember, I remember getting a telephone. Like and, before that, we had like a weird ham radio. Like, are you I mean, serious? It was, really? Yeah, it was, oh, so it's very so, remote. That's not a, that's not an outlandish question. Wow. Um, wow. But anyway, so no, no uh, vintage no vintage uh, P bases up in uh, uh, Fairbanks. Yeah, so I asked my brother if he would find a vintage jazz bass for me. Um, and so I think he had maybe a bass player friend of his help him out. You know, Boston, they're around. Yeah. And he managed to find a great uh, sort of Frankenstein, I think. Uh, I'm not sure to this day whether the headstock, the headstock and the, the headstock's candy apple red. The body's black. Hmm. I think the body might have been refinned. Okay. It definitely was refinned. I don't know if at some point the body and the headstock match, whatever. Anyway, 
because it was all, you know, Frankenstein out, it was 500 bucks. Wow. And it was marked as a 66. Holy smokes. Yeah. Turned out later on, I figured out after I took it apart and looked at the stamp on it, it's a 64. Jasmine. Wow. 500 bucks. Brother, I send my brother 500 bucks, gets me my 64. Thought it was a 66, it was 64. Um, And uh, mails it up to Alaska. I get it. It's still in tune. You're kidding me. From Boston to Alaska. I vividly remember. I that out. is really bad. That's like really exciting when you pick that up, man. Oh, and my God. You got to think, over. wow, what am I getting into here? This is wonderful. That was a, that's a great, great base. Yeah. So, that, I mean, that carried me through college and everything. I'm out here. And yeah. Right. I mean, I'm kind of more of a P-base guy these days. So, my, my beloved jazz base doesn't get a lot of action these days but, yeah yeah but Dude, your brother's cool. giving you the hookup man good guy absolutely for Very sure yeah um name a couple of guitar players that you've enjoyed playing with uh, uh pete townsend <laughs> <laughs> i mean seriously <laughs> i mean oh my god he yeah he's a force man yeah, like he is it's kind of it's amazing, man, when he, you know, like his rhythm playing, his sense of time. Yeah, he's such. Is yeah. astounding. He's, it is a serious thing. I mean, and that actually reminds me, Cheryl Crow. Her time. I mean, she is an incredible musician. She knows her stuff. Um, But, you know, she when she sits up, stands up there and, you know, starts a song on acoustic guitar. The tempo is perfect. Every night, her time is impeccable. Like, um, uh, you know who else? Uh, Steve Stevens. I've done a fair bit of stuff playing with Steve. Dude, that guy. Another. I mean, I'm sensitive to time as a rhythm section bass oh, player yeah, guy. Sure. Steve, like he's on the, top the of things, it. Yeah. Well, not on top of it. He's like no, in I the know. pocket. <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you mean. Uh, he's in the pocket. But yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's kind of what separates the men from the boys in a way hmm. or the girls from the women. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, it's from your perspective. I could totally, that, yeah, that's real important to you. Yeah. And I think to everyone as an audience, like if a band's up there, everybody's rushing and uh, it doesn't sound tough and big. And there's something about when everybody's like kind of on the backside of the beat, it makes, it's just, everything sounds kind of tough and big and like in command. It doesn't sound like, it gets light in the loafers if it gets too on top and uh, everybody's nervous and frantic and it just kind of sounds immature to me. Well, you guys having been playing together for 10 years probably sound fantastic because th- time is a big factor in that. In in, I saw The Fix. Do you remember that band, The Fix? Sure, absolutely, yeah. So this is really weird. I interviewed Jamie West Orham, who's their guitar player, and – like the he goes hey we're gonna be in the states in Clearwater which is like I'm in Tampa it's like I played there yeah okay so and I was like wait Ruth Edgar no 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 they play they actually did an out that's a great arena that's a great venue I love that place but they, they were doing like some outdoor thing but like of, he goes we're only doing we're like two gigs in in clear we're doing one in Clearwater I'm like. Like, <laughs> that's weird great but i mean how weird is that and it was like a week or two weeks after he goes so i came to see them and my god those guys have been playing together since like 81 and it's the same five guys in the band oh wow right i i've i don't think i'd ever maybe the grateful dead i saw them like way the hell back um that's the only other band that the unity those guys had it it, I, it was like uncanny you know and then i'm sure the who is the same thing you know r- 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 well you know it's they're kind of scattered but you know yeah yeah but, i think if if keith and john were still around oh my I, god <laughs> i mean not to take anything away from us ringers that you know do our best but um i that that would be if they were still around they, that would be along those lines Cra- yeah yeah yeah. Time has a lot to do with that, you know. Yeah, and, um, I agree. Just, and I think also uh, sometimes a lot of that can be just uh, sort of uh, uh, if both of you feel it in the same place to begin with. Yeah, there's right. that. You know, I know with Keith Carlock, we talked about he and I 
felt the beat in the same place from minute one. It was like, yeah. boom, we're locked. Just, you know, we, we coincidentally felt it in the same place hmm. and that's huge. Yeah, that is huge. It's, I think there's something to being a, a, an a, a original member, but you know, a, to creating something for sure. I think there's, it's, I it's totally. like a, my, someone once said to me, um, they had their husband passed or, and then they had a new relationship and they said something, they said, look, I really enjoy this, but I'll never have, like my wife and I have been together 26 years and they said, I'll never have what, you know, the memories to look back on that foundation that you guys have. And I guess maybe this musically, it's kind of like that, you know, undoubtedly. Uh, Yeah, totally. Yeah, that that's man, that's a special thing. Like you're talking about a band that yeah. has been playing together with all the original guys for so long. I guess you too yeah, right. would be along those lines, a- right? A- absolutely. Um, yeah, pretty special thing. Um sorry, I didn't mean to go off on a tangent. So you're saying um Pete, Cheryl Crow, Steve Stevens, anybody else that you've enjoyed playing with? Oh I mean, the list can probably go on and on. Nobody jumps out at me off the top of my head at the moment, but yeah. No, all, all good, man. Um, th- this is a tough question. What What are some of the more important things you've learned about yourself, John, throughout your life experience and in, in, in doing all the things you've done? Um, I think on the positive side that I'm a preparer. I love to be prepared. Um, in all aspects. Uh. My hiking buddies make fun of me because I always have <laughs> three extra jackets and they That's you know, awesome. and, and two extra sandwiches and That's you know great. and they, they make all kinds of fun of me until it starts raining halfway through the hike and I'm hungry. <laughs> and they'll like, oh thank God John's here. John <laughs> <laughs> or, Sorry you know, man, I was only kidding. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, exactly. You know, I go camping with the family and you know, I've got a car filled with like tools and rope and like survival (laughs) equipment. And you know, I've got, I live in LA. We've got, I've got the earthquake kit and the, you know, don't tell anybody anybody my address, but I've got all the extra water and, (laughs) and, you know, I'm not a prepper. I was going to, just going to say that he's a prepper. (laughs) No, I I don't. I have 4,000 cans of food in my basement. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Uh, But anyway, I mean, I think that's, a big part of my personality um, and one that has helped me a lot in my yeah, career. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. I love to be prepared. And Are you organized? Prepared, you're, probably, sorry, go ahead. you're organized too, I would imagine. Yeah, I'm a bit OCD yeah. to, a, to a fault. Yeah. Yeah, I'm like. Oh, I, I think you can't. I don't know how people. I'm not OCD, but I'm really well organized. I and I I don't know how people function. Like I don't know how people ever run a business or like you're you know you are a business owner. Absolutely. I, I mean I don't know how people run businesses when they're not organized. There's so many moving parts, and especially if you're a small business owner, you're wearing a lot of hats. And That's I, right. I, and to me, being organized makes so much life so much easier, man. Sure. Yeah. I mean, just down to like, okay you're about to start with the who you have 60 songs to make sure, you know, so yeah. I've got spreadsheets. Of yeah. I'm going to do these two songs. this day and it's going to take me this long and go. Absolutely. <laughs> and I have like a number system of like, you know, how prepared I am on each song. This one's a five out of 10. I better work on that. This one's a 10 out of 10. Cause it's easy. So I skip, you know, like I, I I'm like that, that too, because it takes to, for me, it takes, if you had a, like constantly think of this shit every day that it, it gets like really difficult and it takes the management. It creates a systematic way of approaching things so that you could bite the elephant, you know, eat the elephant one bite at a time, sort of. Correct. Yeah. And all, Which is you got to streamline your time, you know, <sighs> like if you're trying to like, shuffle through like figure it spend time figuring out which song you need to work on or whatever, you know, like you're wasting time that you need because yeah. you know, you don't have all the time in the world to, get all that stuff together. No, man. I always say you can make more money. You cannot make more time, you know? Yeah. That's a good one. I like that. Yeah. You could, you could take it. <laughs> I, I, I receive that and I'm taking it. Um, so yeah, so I'm prepared. I'm organized. Great, um, 
wait, so remind me of the question. The question was <laughs> most, <laughs> I know we're going off on any, all over the board. Uh, most important things you've learned about yourself throughout your life experience. Oh, I, most important things. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. And also, you know, like we talked about the kind of uh, subconscious secret manifesty kind of stuff. I mean, I've That's learned great. that about myself that I, to me, there's to be a little bit on the secret kind of tip. There's something about when I feel confident about something that sort of helps me be able to focus on it, be able to think like I can real realistically accomplish that goal. That's wonderful. Dude. So, you know, like calling my friend and going, Hey, I didn't say, Hey, you want to give me the Cheryl Crow gig? But I, in the back of my head, I was calling to say, Hey, give me the Cheryl Crow gig. Yeah. Yeah. To have the, you know, I have to, in my bones feel, yes, I can do that gig. That is realistic. Um, and part of that feeling for me comes mm -hmm. from the work. Yeah. Being, being prepared and, and just getting my playing together and making sure I'm confident in my playing so I can like get on the phone and be like, yo, yeah, uh, let's do this. I'm ready. No, I think that's I, I've I've been in sales various capacities for my you know for thirty years, and my wife came in the other day and I, she said, "What are you doing?" I said, "I'm preparing for this meeting." She said, "But you've done this a million times." I said, "Yeah, but I've been prepared for all of them." <laughs> you know, uh, and it doesn't mean I'm gonna it's gonna work. I, but if I'm not prepared, it's definitely not gonna work. You know, I right. mean, in my mind anyway. You know, I mean, yeah, yeah I yeah. could wing it, but you know, I'd rather wing on a wing it on a vacation than in a business meeting. You know, that I need to be prepared for. Right. Yeah. So I that's mean, good, man. I didn't. I didn't get all the questions answered, but no, that's, you know, that's that's no, no. You're doing. I've got your answers you're, written. Yeah, I prepared. You're, yeah, you're I very well prepared. Quest, most of the questions, dude. So tell me, tell me some questions that you want. Since you did all that work, let's let's <laughs> let, me, let me accommodate. No, just, no let me. You it. sure, man? I would. I could accommodate yeah. your all this uh, effort you've done. Um, yeah, okay. I'm trying to figure out a, a snarky question to ask you now that's related <laughs> to pre preparation and writing all that stuff down. Um, a lot of people do that. Some people do, and but not, no, I think a, I think a lot of people usually have some answers down there because there's a, so many questions, and I don't know. I never know what I'm going to ask. You know, it's, it's like it's kind of like a right, surprise to me. You know, so, some of the things you know, you you just space. You know, a person's name or a, like. Well, well, you're not thinking about that stuff all day. You know, like uh, what are your biggest struggles or something like that? And you're like, yeah. <laughs> Oh, hang on. Um, what, what about the flip? Okay, so that's probably what you like most about yourself. How about the flip side? Anything about yourself you'd want to change? And by the way, you are a very nice guy. You're one of the easiest guys to hang out. I can see why, you know. Thank you. I yeah, appreciate man, that. Super um, easy. I think sometimes I might be nice to a fault. So yeah, I, I, maybe I, I could be not yeah. so nice all the time, you know? Try not to be a, a doormat. I hear you. Um, that's a that's a a lot of people that are nice have that issue. It can be a, yeah. a fine line to walk, you know, to not not get trampled on. Um, I, I always try to be fair, and I, and to me, fair means being fair to you and fair to me. Totally, that's a great way to look at it. I like that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. and it's it's that's really helped me. That's yeah, because nice. like like it, I'm I'm really very fair in business, and like. If there's a point where I'm like, this is ridiculous, I'll just say, hey, listen, guys, that's it. We're done. I'm being, I, I'm, I'm really yeah. a fair person and I'm very confident in that. I don't know how I know I'm right. fair, but I, I feel like that. And I'm like, hey, this is where we're at. I'm really, it's important to be fair to you, but it's important to be fair to me. Totally. If that doesn't work, that's totally cool. I respect that. Right. And yeah. I and I mean it because like I'm not going to be fair unfair to myself because like it, then I'm going to hate what I'm doing, uh, you know. I'm going to hate I can myself. Totally relate to that. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I think I'm I'm I've gotten better at that over the years. And mm -hmm. I you know I mean I don't have a manager or an agent or anything. So like when I book a gig, sometimes it's just me on the phone with some uh, you know sharky manager like trying to negotiate my fee for the tour, you know? And wow, so yeah. I can relate to that. Yeah. And I've definitely, there have been tours in the past where I just had to say like, no, that's not going to work for me. And see you and, later. And that's it, man. And you then two days later they call back. I'm like, mm, okay. That, that, and 99% of the time the same thing happens. They're like, okay, let's, we're good. You know, 
and and that only validates you know sort of like my threshold there you know like i know i we're we're, we're yeah we're good and if you don't think right. so this is not you know your problems are not my problems sort of thing you know right I, this guy interviewed um really good guitar player named ben yardley and he plays with a band called la chinga out of canada they're sort of like a stoner rock band and he was he's a guy who got sober and one of the things he got um a lot of people who are involved in drugs, they have ish. They, they're like, they want to please other people, and that whole this whole thing is tough for them. You know, interesting. We're, we're, wanting to say no, and ah. he, and he said, "Hang on, say he." I just want to say what he said before I forget it. He said he had this thing, and he said, "I I realized how you feel about me is none of my business." interesting and i was like man yeah. that was really cool how you feel about me is not my business like it's your shit right. you know how you feel about me is not my not my business you know me from the bronx yeah. i'd be like you know how this is your problem how you feel about me is your problem you know not mine and and you're entitled to that but i'm not making your problems my problems you know right and uh, I, that's I, interesting. That's yeah, good. Yeah, I thought that was really cool. Sorry, I, I, were you, you going to say something about getting oh, sober? I don't or something? Know. It doesn't matter. No, about it's getting all... sober and then like, um, uh, doesn't matter. I, I think we're all getting sober in some way or another. No, seriously, <laughs> right. I mean, like, life is not easy, man. I mean, you might not be getting sober from drugs, but like, you know, you got to figure this shit out. It's not like hopefully, hopefully, you're yeah, improving hope, yourself, right? Not, you know, yeah, right. Um, I think you know, actually, you and the initial question was what things I might. Want change to change yeah. about myself. I think another thing would be to not worry about things so much. I can tend to sort of stress a little bit or worry about every minute detail. And I think that's, I think that's for everyone as they got older, you start just like, yeah, you know, you do. worrying about stuff less. You just like, you know, yeah. let the rain roll off the ducks back to, you know, as time goes on a hundred percent because you realize how much stress you're making and you're like at least for me one day i just yeah. literally woke up and said uh i realized how much stress in my life was not the universe's fault but was me and i'm like and it was like turning off a light switch i said you know i'm done and yeah. it was just like that I, I was done and i and i was just like so it was like taking a one million pound weight off my shoulders and i'm like bye and i, I you know and now I feel my, like my my dad's getting really good at that. He's man, eighty five. Yeah, and it's just like ah, I don't got time for that. Right, that's pretty much None what this, it is. He doesn't worry. Doesn't seem to worry about much. Nothing phases him. He's just like, chill. What, what, how, what does that do for you? You know, it's like you know, no thanks. Yeah. Um, tell me something about yourself. Some people would be surprised to hear, or might find a little odd. Uh, I'm vegan. Oh, that's not odd. No, Come on, no, I'm interviewing no, musicians, no. dude. Are you kidding right. me? Uh, I drive a 2006 Honda Odyssey. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Good for you. 2006 Honda. How many miles you, you got on that sucker? Oh, close to 100,000. That's nothing. For a Honda, you're just getting started, dude. That's right. Well, I bought it used with low miles, man. That's great. Uh, it's funny, you know, so when I, I was playing in vegas with the who and we were flying we were staying in la and flying on a private jet to vegas for the shows and flying back right that must be awful yeah it's terrible <laughs> but it's funny because so we're in the private jet flying back and the tour manager who drives a really nice porsche was like oh john i forgot to get you an uber to go home i was like oh dang and then i was like oh yeah I drove, I drove myself to the airport. My car's there. And then, so it came up, Oh, what do you drive? And it's like, you know, the who is in the private. It's like, these guys all have like, they're into cars, like Pete's Pete okay. and Roger, super into fancy cars and all this stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they're like, Oh wait, yeah. What kind of car do you have? I'm like, 2006 Six Honda, Honda Odyssey, Odyssey soccer fan. And they're, they all just look perplexed. Like, yeah, but what? if you're not into cars, it's like a car right. is like a pencil. The worst investment you could ever make. I'm just like, yeah. you know, I it, bought it cash. Like, 
there you go. Yeah, right. And you, I, I actually, I love my Honda Odyssey. It's killer. No, you, dude, look, you got a young family. <laughs> You're doing all the, to me, uh, you sound like a super smart dude. I mean, you know, like what, what are you going to do? Spend a hundred grand on a car? Just because you have money doesn't mean you have to spend money on that. You know, well, you, hey man, man, I got to save up for my for my retirement. Yeah, man, for that for your kids' college educations, what you got to save up for, man. Yeah, right. Uh, Those, that's expensive. So you're, well, don't all vegans drive 2006 Honda Odysseys? No, they all drive uh, <laughs> the 2004 vegan? Subarus. Oh, Subaru, is that the thing out there? That's funny. Or right? maybe a Volkswagen van. A Subaru. I used to like, I like those Subarus. Are a Subaru around anymore? I don't think. Oh, absolutely. Oh, they are? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you have any non-musical superpowers? Have, you must have some. <laughs> no, not that I can think of. No, you got to have <laughs> some, man. Uh, I thought about that question for a while. I don't uh, I, I can't uh non musical super I'd have to you'd have to ask uh, well that sounds weird. Let's you have to ask, you ask your ask, wife. Ask. <laughs> All right. Let's get her on the phone. No, I'm just kidding. Um no the, the only the, uh, there's a question I always um feel I should be asking the wives and um I didn't ask it to you. I, I can't think of which one it was, but there's uh I don't know. Anyway. Uh, what's an example of a non-musical superpower i can't even think of like, um like some guys like they're really you know like a macgyver type you know i could fix anything right or i'm really yeah. good at sports you know or I, I build you know widgets you know whatever or i'm i'm really good at painting you know i've had a lot of guys you know of course I, a lot of creative i guys. just play bass yeah i, I draw <laughs> some guys draw really I, I, well yeah i i can't do any of that <laughs> No, but I think I think you're pretty. Intu- I think you seem to be a pretty intuitive guy. That's a superpower, I think. Yeah, I mean, I I have some. I, I'm fairly clever. I think I can. Figure yeah, I things think you up, are pretty clever, you know? man. Yeah, for sure. And that's a superpower. I mean, John, there's a lot of stupid people out there, so that's a superpower. <laughs> trust me. Um, you have any hobbies outside of music? Uh, I I enjoy hiking. Yeah, that's cool, man. I there's some really nice. There are some really nice local mountains that I like to go to with some buddies. We go hike around. Um, I I was into motorcycles for a while, but I got uh, I got nailed by a car, and then I had a kid. And holy crap, man! So uh, seriously, all right? Did you get like? Did you get like? I got pretty hurt, but I'm good now. Wow! Uh, But so I gave that up. But that was a good hobby. I really enjoyed that. but it's a bit, bit dangerous, especially for my career. I don't need to. Uh, yeah. I you don't bust need to, up my hands. Don't need to die on a motorcycle. Yeah, <laughs> well, even just, you know, I break a finger and I'm up a creek, you know? Somebody told me, I was talking to some people here that were really into bikes, and it, it seems like it's a very, like I have a couple of buddies who do it, and it seems really relaxing. And this is what they told me. They said, listen, if you take a motorcycle out on an old country road, it is gorgeous. There's nothing like it. Once you go on the highway, that goes from being a gorgeous thing to you're literally going to get killed. Yeah. And I mean, the the highway is just so like, there's so much, it's loud and there's trucks and yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. yeah. I mean, my main thing, I love just going up, like you say, like a, they're around here, around LA, in the mountains, there are these little two lane mountain roads. You go on a weekday, there's nobody there. Right. That's go beautiful. winding up these beautiful mountain roads. And it's just, yeah. And also one of the things that I loved about it was you have to focus on what you're doing completely, yeah. which is great because then you can't worry about all this other. Oh, so it was a really good, dist- it was like a, a good dist- a meditation. A distraction. Yeah. It was like a meditation. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you're just focusing on that. Yeah. And yeah, it's, it's really nice. Is playing bass or playing your instrument somewhat of a meditation for you? For sure. Yeah. I would imagine. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. It's, it's really actually interesting because, um, like a meditation, um, I'll find sometimes when I'm playing, like memories and thoughts will just like pop into my head that I have not thought about ever for a year like just some random thing because your mind is uh, hopefully your mind is so relaxed and open and yeah. like stuff just pops like strange things just pop into your head you're like well that was interesting all right that's really cool i gotta yeah. tell you I, i've only been playing guitar three years and i gotta tell you that's the most uh 
addictive part for me is when I play, I'm so present in what I'm doing and I feel so good. I, you know, I wish I had time. I'd play for hours and hours a day without uh-huh. batting an eye. It's, it's such a like cathartic, um, you know, I always have, I'm always so much more Zen afterwards. Right. Even if it's yeah. just a half hour or 40 minutes, I'm like so chilled out. It's just really like for me, really wonderful, you know, very. It is. It's nice. I mean, it's funny, you know, when you get off stage from a big show, like with the who, it's definitely not. I mean, there's an aspect of that, but also you're just. Oh, you're so, putting so much emotionally energy. like, oh, it's crazy. Yeah. To try sometimes to wind down after a show. It's, it's pretty crazy. Cause it's, yeah, it's a lot of, uh, it's just, a, it's a lot, you know, it's, it's both exciting and draining and like, you're putting so much uh, emotion into it, but also like cerebral thought and focus and like, it's, well, plus you have the pressure of performing. Yeah. So it's not, and, it's you're playing, but you have a, you know, you got a job to execute as yes. well. And, and so <laughs> yeah. that's, it's not like, you know, a couple of guys hanging out in a bar, you know, just fooling around, you know, that whatever yeah. happens, happens. You a know, lot you of got, pressure. Yeah. You got to, yeah. And, and you're, you're with, guys that are at the top of their game and have done so for 50 years. So yeah, right. I could totally see that. And, one. and every moment of my life is on YouTube. And that's oh, the weird thing. Oh yeah. These days, man. Like it used to be, you know, eh, you screw up, it's gone. But now at like, you know, playing with a band like the who, everything is on, on there. Everything. You know what? Um, I've talked to a couple of guys and one of the things that bother them the most is um, if they're not playing, well, even if you're in a stadium or in a big arena like you're in, you're not – when you pick up your phone, you're not – the sound on this thing is not transferable, right? Especially so, as a bass player. Right. And so then what they, they, they said, what I really can't stand is somebody posts it and then somebody puts comments on there. God, this guy sounds awful. Don't can he get a good sound system? And he's like, I mean, are you are, really? Thank you. Thank really? You. Yes. You know, or else I mean, they, so. I mean, like I really? said, as a bass player, as a bass it's even player, worse. yeah, people, yeah, yeah, you know, and of course, everybody's judging me because it's like, well, how does he compare to Ben Twistle, right? Kino Palladino, right? You know, and so they're just at home on YouTube, like looking up clips and like, well, he's not loud enough. He doesn't have that sound and. It's like, dude, it's recorded on an iPhone. You're listening to it through laptop speakers and like, come on. I never engage. I have a couple of guys that they'll post stuff. Like one guy, uh, I interviewed somebody and he had, he made a, a an award, he had an award that he won for a, a video that he made in the eighties. And so somebody post, and so I said, oh, is that on, is there any chance it's on YouTube? He goes, yeah, he goes, uh, maybe, I think so. And somebody apparently searched the entire internet apparently <laughs> and uh i guess it wasn't there and he goes what a fucking idiot this guy and this is what he said he's, he's taking the time to write <laughs> he's taking the time to actually write like he's got that i mean like man i wish i had that much time i would never be spending it doing that but i wish i had that much time to do nothing and he's like what a fucking idiot this is how can you not know if your own videos on youtube then other people are like dude most artists like aren't really obsessed with their own stuff and like, you know, and then I don't answer those comments ever, ever. And right. so he wrote another one like louder because <laughs> I guess, because I didn't <laughs> answer caps. it. No, it's just like nastier. Like, like, right. like, like, Hey, like, uh, you know, it's like if you're talking to your child and you know, you didn't hear him the first time, daddy, you know, let me say it again. Like, it, but that's what it was like. Like, okay. And I still am not, I mean, like who engages with stuff like that? But yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I feel for you, man. Cause everybody's a damn critic. Okay. Get your ass right. out on there on stage with Daltrey and Townsend and see, you know, do a, yeah, do a better England job with no sleep. Yeah, and I mean, you know, please. people don't know what, I mean, and, and you then, know, I don't need to make excuses for myself, but you know, like people don't know what you're going, you know, no, what's, what and this isn't through. a culmination of a show, man. This is a culmination of, you know, 25, 35 years of you doing this. Yeah. You know, you didn't get there overnight. You got there over your lifetime. 
You know, so sure. I mean, it's just, just stupid when people criticize like that. It <laughs> irritates the shit because the people who do that have people who like it's probably in his mom's basement or something like that, and he's my age. You know. <laughs> anyway, rant over. What's your favorite? <laughs> I just hate you know. Do something with your time, man. Feel good about yourself. Don't criticize. <laughs> you know, bitch. Um, <laughs> favorite place you've traveled, man. You've probably been all over. I have been all over. Yeah, I've been everywhere. It's actually really amazing to have gotten to see the world and gotten paid for it and played bass. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, Shakira, we went everywhere, everywhere, um, which was incredible. Um, Favorite place. I really loved Columbia. Interesting. Um, And there are a few reasons I say that Um, one, I think is partially because, uh, it's sort of different, you know, like, you know, if you say, I mean, a lot of people have been to Italy and Italy is amazing. And, you know, a lot of people have been to Hawaii. Well, Hawaii is amazing, but everybody's been there. But I think Colombia is misunderstood from, especially from Americans. Yeah. You know, like, Oh, Colombia. Yeah. That's the, scary. The cart, the drug capital of, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and the other reason that kind of helped me fall in love with it was that the first time I went there, the first show I did there uh, was with uh, an artist named Robbie Draco Rosa, who's really well known down there, not so well known up here. Um, he wrote and produced Ricky Martin's big record. Oh, wow. Um, he was also in Menudo. He's an amazing artist. Um, so I was playing with him. We went to Columbia. First show we play there, um, some local people sort of uh, started talking to me like it was like off the side of the stage. It was a pretty big show, but they kind of worked their way up. And they were like, "Hey, what's going on? You were great, blah blah blah. What are you doing tomorrow?" I'm like, I, I don't know. They're like, "We'll show you around. Here's my number. Call me." So this is like day two in Colombia, and they're like the sweetest people in the That's world. They really call, cool. call me up, take me out, show me around, blah blah blah. And then so I hung with them on that trip, and then. The next time I came, like, I mean, on that trip, they, I think I had a day off and they took me out to their like parents country house, which was amazing outside of Bogota. Um, and they did not and, kidnap you. No. Right. Right. They didn't. <laughs> Cause that's all, that's um, the other thing you hear about down in, in South America, all the, you know, that kind of stuff. For sure. Yeah. Um, so, th- and that's part of why I was able to enjoy it because the next time I came, I, I was touring again with Robbie, Robbie Rosso. We came there again, I think. Um, and I said, Hey, I want to stay an extra three days after oh, that's cool, our man. tour is done. So I hung out with these people and like, we went off to some other like place out in the country and you couldn't, you know, if you're just some tourist, no, you're you not privy to, know, to Yeah. You have to know where not to go Yeah, there. And if you know where to go, you're it's fine you're safe that's so i was with some locals that took me under their wing and they were sweet as can be and just showed me an amazing time and showed me the real columbia i bet the food is delicious there uh, yeah it was amazing i mean and just it's beautiful there just beautiful and the people are incredible and just you know seeing all kinds of amazing stuff and that, that was really a rich experience that's cool man so you get to, they they have a lot of supposedly good coffee there too. Is it? I'm, a, I'm like a bit of a coffee yeah. snob. Is is a good? Yeah. yeah, I love good. That's cool, man. Very. That's a that's a new one. I've not heard that. Yeah. Um, toughest to see. No, talk about a specific experience that changed your life or altered the way you think about things. Oof, man, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I mean, I suppose uh, deciding to go for it and move to LA. Right. Yeah. I mean, or, or even deciding to, you know, move from a lot, like, yeah, that's a big move. I I, I think that's, that's a huge move. Yeah. I was 18, got in my car by myself, you know, got my base and a couple. Are you drove? Wait a minute. You drove. Yeah. Through Canada and, yeah. Wow. 3,000, 3,020 something miles. Wow. Took me seven days. Yeah. I'm 18 by myself. You, did you sleep in your car or did you sleep in hotels? I had or? a tent. A I tent? Camped, I wow. Camped part of the way. 
You are like a rustic uh, mountain guy. That's awesome. Yeah. And I, man, I had a crazy, so. That is wild. I wish I. It was I, pretty wild. Yeah. I, I wish I, I would mean, be I can't believe my parents tent. just were like, yeah, see you later. Good luck. Well, what are they going to do? You're, as a parent, once, and especially you were like the fifth kid. Yeah. Oh, you, once you're 18, it's like, you know you don't even think to do anything because you know they're not going to listen and they have the right that's to true. do what they want. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, true. you know, I, I we we and it got easier and easier each kid cuz you learn that lesson, you know, and it's just easier for them, easier for you and right. they can't say anything. Right. But I <laughs> That's wild, man. It, it was it was scary at times. Yeah. Um so when you're going through like uh eastern Alaska and through Canada, it gets pretty like it's a little two lane road and there's nothing ice truckers yeah right well <laughs> thankfully it was in the summer but yeah pretty much so you're yeah. you know i had a you know toyota corolla and i'm driving along and you know you start to hear like some funny like making like is my car gonna break down and like because you're not seeing all of, co- of course you know, there aren't other cars passing you're just like it's you and that's amazing I mean, yeah. And there was one point where I was running low on gas. And I was like, okay, I'll stop at the next gas station. I stopped at the next gas station and they were either their power 400 was miles away. <laughs> right. Kind of. They were either, either they were out of gas. Oh, wow. The gas station ran out of gas or they didn't have electricity. One or the other. And so there was a decision of like, I can go back 50 i can go back like 20 miles or go forward 40 miles and i was on and so i think i forget i somehow i forget the exact deal but like i had to go to another gas station and either the like one gas station was out of electricity the other one that i went to that was like 20 miles away was out of gas and then i mean and i'm in the middle of nowhere and i'm it was i remember that being like yeah that's a big that's that's a big move for a young kid yeah, and I managed to like somehow it worked out clearly, and uh, you know I yeah, but, found a spot and worked but it out. You do these things that challenge you, and that's what gives you the confidence for the next thing. You know, true. It gives you the coping skills and builds all that. character. It does, man. I mean, you know, it does. <laughs> you don't build character sitting in the bed, man, watching TV. You know, I mean, that's yeah. just the reality of it. You build character, but by being scared of doing shit and doing it anyway, and and sometimes failing at it, and sometimes not. You know. All right. And That's then really cool, you, you build character further by rolling into Texas in <laughs> August, <laughs> and it's 350 that, degrees yeah, and like humid. Be... And I'm like, I don't, I've never experienced heat like this. My car, like, oh, and there's just, no humidity. There's well, no humidity. Yeah, it's pretty mellow. I mean, yeah, it's not. That's right. It's fairly arid where I grew up in Alaska, and yeah. it doesn't get that hot. Yeah, and you know, you don't. A lot of cars at that point in Alaska, you don't have air conditioning. Like, why? oh my god, oh yeah, because you so, don't need it. It's like being in England; they don't have air conditioners in their house. Yeah. So I have a car with no air conditioning, and the dorm, this piece of junk dorm that you stay in your first year there, yeah. no air conditioning. So, oh, you're kidding! I, I'm like, wait a minute, talk about shock. And, That's really oppressive that they don't have AC yeah. in the dorm. Oh, they probably do now, but back in the dark ages when I was there. Yeah. That's but talk weird. about building character. Yeah. that's. Ooh, God, I think they even have air conditioning in prisons. They couldn't have it in a dorm. <laughs> I would think, you know. Wow. Good for you, man. Yeah. Um, anything you regret not doing? Uh, well, we talked, uh, I think. Background vocals. Singing. Yeah. Yeah. I think that was, uh, I can't think of like a gig that. Came, oh no that's right so what i i was playing with a couple of friends back in the day um cleto escobedo and uh jeff babco a couple of la guys yeah, uh, do, and we had jeff babco that? why do i know that name? jeff babco is a very well-known yeah. keyboard player he yeah okay monster um big la session guy and does everything plays with everyone um great guy um so they had a band like an original band Mm. this is way back and i was playing with them we recorded a few things maybe played a couple gigs blah blah and then uh i got i think i got called to do the michelle branch Mm. tour maybe some tour came up 
And I'm like, sorry, dudes, I'm going to bail. I'm going to go do this tour. Um, and that their band, sort of the nucleus of that band ended up becoming the house band for, uh, what's the late night TV show host, Jimmy Kimmel, uh, Jimmy Kimmel. Thank you. So mm. I don't know that I would have ended up on that, Yeah, but maybe if I had hung with that, maybe I would have had like 15 years of steady was, was in town. Toshi go. in that band then? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I interviewed him. He's a good guy. Uh, he's great. Great he's player awesome. too. He's amazing and really? hilarious and all yeah, that. Really, uh, he's funny. <laughs> but so that's one, you know, somewhere in the back of my mind, I always go, huh, I wonder. Yeah, if that's a, t- that's a tough out. one. You know, because I mean, that was one dream of mine as a kid. Like I, my oldest brother turned me on to David Letterman mm-hmm. and I used to watch David Letterman to watch the band. Right. Because, you know, Will Lee and yeah. all those guys, um, it was Steve Jordan back in, in the day. Um, and that was sort of a, a dream of mine, like to be the house band on one of those TV shows. I mean, that's a pretty seemingly pretty cool gig. I know. It, I think it can get kind of tedious. I think if I did a survey, would you rather be in the house band on Kimmel or in the who? <laughs> yeah, right. I think you'd win with the who I could be <laughs> sure. wrong. Yeah. But that's my yeah. knee jerk reaction. Uh, I, mean, I, yeah, I will I, stick I, with that. <laughs> things have worked out. All right. I, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but th- I understand what you're saying. You always kind of wonder. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, the aspect of the house band on a TV show when you have a wife and a son is like, you can stay home. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, except, you know? um, like Jimmy V, I interviewed him and they, they, they got rid, they don't have a band anymore. Conan, that they don't have a, they got rid of all the music on the show. Right. So, right. you know, then there's always that aspect. Sure. You never know. So nothing lasts forever. Nothing lasts yeah. forever. So um, I mean, you know, no big regrets. I things have things have worked out quite nicely. I cannot complain. I'm yeah, man. Very blessed. And I and it seems I think you're in your right place too because you seem like everything is very organic with you. You know how things have come I about. Think, so I think you're kind of in the, where you're supposed to be there too. You know. Yeah, I think so. It feels feels fairly natural. Last question, man. And I really appreciate your time. You've been wonderful to talk to, man. I mean, you're a super cool guy. I, thank you for being so open and. Um, so easy to talk with yeah back at you thanks man um biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years and how much of that has been intentional and how much is just a natural part of aging oh i i would say a lot of it is a natural part of aging i uh i i don't know that i've changed a lot i think i would probably hopefully i like we talked about i worry less you're pretty aware, so I bet you have changed more than you think. Uh, maybe. No, you got a pretty high level of yourself, aw- awareness. Uh, changing, you know, like you're, you're stuck with yourself every day. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you don't see you know, that change. Do, you know, you come back and you see your kids change, right? But when you're with them every day, you don't notice those changes. So, um, do you yeah, know, I would say. Adam would, Zimmon. Who? Adam Zimmon. Very well. He's a dear friend. I, I yeah. figured you did. Um, I asked him this question one time. It's said, Adam's hilarious. He's so funny. He's so funny. So and, funny. So dry and brilliant. He's coming down here soon too. I'm looking forward to hooking up with him. And um, <laughs> I'm laughing because he was just funny. I said to him something like, you know, what do you like about yourself? And he goes, how can I answer that question when I have so much self-loathing? <laughs> Oh, you man. reminded me of that when you said, "Oh, I can't see myself change." <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> reminded me of Adam. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think worrying less, uh, s- sticking up for myself more, like we talked about, not being too nice, being Good nice you, to man. myself. Good for you, man. And you know, like you know, and and being more confident and brave. I think you know, as you get older, you you know. You, you get a little, hopefully, you get a little more confident. And, and also just by nature of, I mean, you know, once you jump up on stage with The Who and play in front of a stadium, you know. Yeah, man. You, you're up on stage <laughs> with The Who. Screw you, bitches. That's right, man. John Button, bass player with The Who. Oh, man. That's awesome. Yeah, you got to, you got to, some, man, you, 
you have to keep that in check, man. It's easy every once in a while. It's, you know, some thing ain't, ain't going right at the grocery store. Do you know who I am? I play with you know? <laughs> <laughs> Every once in a while, that thought will creep up in the back of your head. And you're just like, no, no. Kids are the humbling factor, man, I think, probably, right? Oh. Because uh, your kid doesn't totally. care who you are, what you do oh, for a living, is. man. He's going to be your, you know, your kid and, yeah. you know, you're just I mean, he kind of knows and he, you know, he thinks it's kind of cool, but. He's only five, but, you said, right? Yeah. And he knows already. That's pretty good. Yeah. He's a clever little dude. Good, man. Sent his ass away to college sooner, you know. <laughs> right? Maybe. <laughs> Um, man, I can't thank you enough for everything, John. I really appreciate it. Anytime, come back here anytime you want. Anything you want to, uh, you're doing any project, please come back. I'd love to support it, man. I really appreciate it. You've been great to talk to, and uh, hopefully, I'll see you down here soon. Yeah, um, I'll let you. Yeah, please do. Everybody, thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this interview, please share it with a friend or on your social media channels. We appreciate your support. Thanks very much to John Button for spending time with us. Check out John on tour with The Who, with Roger Daltrey. Any other projects you got working on? Nope. <laughs> All right. We'll check him out on tour with The Who and Roger Daltrey. And uh, make sure you go to everyonelovesguitar.com. Sign up to get on our newsletter list so you and I can connect. And most important, remember that happiness is a choice. So choose wisely. Be nice. Go play your guitar or your bass and have fun. Yeah, man. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I'm out. We hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, subscribe to the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, and you can do this online at everyonelovesguitar.com or on iTunes. And if you like the show, please leave us a five-star positive review. The more five-star reviews we get, the higher our show ranks, and higher rankings mean we get to continue speaking with cool, interesting guests on our show. We'll see you on the next episode, and until then, keep playing your guitar and have fun making music. <laughs>